Welcome back, everybody. I'm here with my buddy Ryan Franklin. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. We went to Catania, Sicily together and did a mission trip where we worked with West African refugees. And now he works at Team Expansion. But I'm going to let him introduce himself and talk about himself for a minute. So, Ryan, thanks for being on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a cool opportunity to kind of tell people about some different uh, opportunities here in Louisville. Um, yeah. And it's kind of crazy because not a lot of people will know of Team Expansion. Mm -hmm. um, and really what Team Expansion is all about um, is making disciples who make disciples who then make disciples. Yeah. Um, uh, biblical discipleship and um, just ways to uh, walk alongside the, the local church or the global church um, and, and make that happen. Yeah. Um, however... Team Expansion uh, primarily focuses on the unreached people groups of the world, so okay. um, people who do not have an opportunity, um, like we do here, like in Louisville, where there's a church on every corner, right? Um, to hear the gospel. So whenever we say unre unreached, um, that means less than 5% evangelical presence within either a people group within a country yeah. or sometimes a whole country. Um, okay. Uh, for example, in Africa, you might find many different tribes or villages that are considered themselves unreached. Okay. Um, or, for example, Japan is an entire country who, yeah. who is unreached. Um, and and five percent is a little generous. Um, depends on who you're asking in terms of researcher. Um, some people would would say five percent. Some people would kind of lower that to two point five percent. Okay. So. Really, Team Expansion has uh, missionaries all over the world, even here in Louisville, working yeah. with uh, refugees in Louisville, but also throughout the world. So there's not really a particular region or, or continent. It's all over the place, just as long as it's unreached. But your your demographic is kind of like just the most deprived places in the world as far as where the gospel's reached. In terms of the gospel, yes. Sometimes... Yeah. Um, in terms of impoverished uh, populations, not always the case. Yeah. Um, I know, for example, um, there's a team in in India working um, with with an upper caste, so it's not necessarily poverty, but a lot of cases um, it is poverty because normally where you don't have the gospel, yeah, um, there there is poverty. So. Right. Okay. Cool. Well, what is your main? What is your position in team expansion specifically? Um, so my role and is... And I'm going to scoot this up to you here. Sure. No worries. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, my, my role is uh, Director of Internships at Team Expansion, um, and that, that sounds pretty fancy, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's it's that fancy. But also I think it's uh, a huge, huge role in terms of the kingdom of God because right. um, what that entails is um, raising up the next generation of missionaries. Um, yeah. How can we uh, continue to move forward and to continue to raise up uh, the kingdom and build the kingdom yeah. without missionaries stepping up to the plate? Yeah, um, I believe that God um, is going to get the job done no matter what, because mm -hmm. um, we have the end of the book. Yeah, uh, but why not be a catalyst uh, for the cause by one actively making disciples who make disciples, right? But also raising up new generations of missionaries as well. And so, you you kind of have to be the guy to prepare them for what they're about to encounter. Exactly. So um, given the experience that I've had doing more, many, many, um, uh, given my experience um, throughout the world working uh, under veteran missionaries, um, they've asked me to um, uh, fill this role because of that experience, because I've had the opportunity to do prep and terms of support raising, but also yeah. cross-cultural preparation. And I also had a degree um, in intercultural studies. So okay. given all of those uh, factors, they've asked me to, to fill this role to best prepare students for cross-cultural ministry, no matter the age. Okay. Um, we do have a requirement of 18, but uh, right. no matter the age in terms of, of youth. Okay. So when it comes to preparing for uh, an intern for missions and cross-cultural um, communications what is some of the things that you prepare them for the most or what do you emphasize the most well first and foremost um, team expansion is an organization of prayer right um, I hate to say it but it seems like um, 
prayer can get a lot of lip service these days. To people just say, yes, I will pray for you. You're or, absolutely right. We, we um, emphasize prayer. Right. Um, but um, what exactly do you mean when you say that? Are you actually going to follow through? Um, yeah. And so the one thing that we try to emphasize and build up in our interns um, mm -hmm. and full-time workers is, um, is prayer one themselves to mm -hmm. make sure that they are actively seeking God in the work that they're doing. Yeah. But also we do require that um, the full-time workers and interns have um, 100 prayer partners that they are um, communicating with um, in terms of prayer requests, needs, um, praises, um, the things like that. Um, and, wow. I, and I myself have that as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, whenever everything is founded on prayer, yeah. um, we believe um, you know, success is only in a matter of time. So. Yeah. So praying is um, uh, first and foremost emphasized. Okay. Yes. Um, other things we try to emphasize um, is, is um, an open mind in terms of how to go about things. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it, one word that I absolutely hate to hear um, is the word weird. Weird, yeah. Um, because, I don't know, it just seems to kind of have a negative connotation because something that someone does right. could just be different. and It's a matter of perspective. Yeah, it, right. it, it's not necessarily wrong. Right. Um, and so I like to, to, to open students' minds and, and just help them to realize that, yes, they are different, but God does love them. Yeah. Um, and God has a purpose for their life as well. Um, yeah. So they aren't, they aren't weird. Right. Just different in your eyes, and so yeah. let's just go about um, everything together, type of thing. So nice. Um, so when you're preparing, you know, people to do internships and everything, what is probably one of the most difficult challenges that that they'll face, or that you yourself face, when it comes to these internships and doing missions and stuff like that? Um, I would say the biggest difficulty is um, helping people see outside the box. Mm -hmm. um, here in America, we kind of have a certain set of rules or systems in place to, to reach um, X, Y, Z. Right. Um, and whenever we're dealing with God, um, that's not always the case. It's just not um, how it works. Yeah. And normally that's for our benefit. Yeah. Um, so sometimes people hear, oh my gosh, this is going to cost that much money to do this, or... Um, I have to do this and that. Yeah. Um, you know, we have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, as our advocate, as our coworker, right. um, everything is possible. And yeah. Um, as we saw in Sicily, you know, we prayed and, and and saw some amazing things happen that we did not even expect. It is still amazing to think back to that. Yeah. Like some of the things that did happen. Absolutely. So. My my goal in whenever I'm speaking with, with students is to help them see outside the box. Right. To, to help them realize that, yes, um, here's a story that I can tell you um, where yeah. God boldly moved in, in people's lives where we did not even expect it. And I'm confident that right. he can do the same in yours. Right. Even if that means something so minute of raising $5,000. Right. Exactly. Um, yes. So I think one of the things that when I wasn't prepared for it and then I came back from Sicily was realizing how the community that we live in is just not reality for the rest of the world. Like Sicily is a beautiful place, but the things that we saw and dealt with out there and then coming back and just looking around, I was like, this is Disneyland. Like, we live in a theme park, and this is just not the case for the rest of the world. Like, people having to improvise on just, like, where they're going to live and, like, how they're going to get water. That's, like, something that I didn't fully grasp until I got back, and it seems like, it seems so simple, but, like, to have that commodity, like, taken away like where we had to buy bottles of water every day or like we kind of had to like focus on like, Hey, we've got this much water for right now. Like we've got to use it accordingly. It definitely like wrecked my perspective when I got back because I was like, wow, I, I hate complaining now. Like even when I start to think about wishing for a better situation, I'm like, Holy cow. I actually had to buy water like before, like this is Disneyland. Yeah. But 
Yeah, and that processing that you're doing right there is mm -hmm. what we try to help uh, begin while the while the students are still in the United States to mm -hmm. help begin turning their gears in terms of what they're going to expect, but also mm -hmm. begin to help them see their current um, sphere right. um, and, and begin that debrief process. So whenever they return, you know, they're, they're better able to process the things that they've seen and then go forward with it. So it's just not another trip that they go on, but rather right. how they saw, saw God work mm -hmm. and how they can, can move forward with that, but yeah. also empowered um, as, a, as, a, as a Christ follower. So you've got a briefing process and then a debriefing process. And I remember when we got back, you were, they put you in this building for like three days and like you had to fill out some stuff, but then you just had to sit and talk. As far as like that goes, um, how did that benefit you specifically? Because that's, I feel like that's a thing that not a lot of people get the chance to do. Well, I don't think you truly learn um, from an experience until you've um, sat and thought about it and, and then talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, you can do something over and over again, or you can have this amazing experience, but if you just return home and move on with your life, right? Um, did, what did you learn from that? Is your life any different? Right. Was it beneficial? Um, so we do have a briefing process, an orientation week, to where we kind of help interns um, prepare with the things that they're going to see, mm -hmm. but also do some team building um, to help um, their team run smoothly when they're on the field. Because yeah, culture shock is real, and it's not it's not necessarily negative, but it's going to be something that you're faced, and it's, you're going to be confronted with things that are very very difficult. Yeah, um, and, the, and and how you go about um, decision making in, in the midst of those struggles yeah. um, can be can be very very important. Um, so that's kind of what we help them beforehand, but we also help them see what's in front of them, but also in a way see the finish line mm -hmm. without being um, too far ahead of ourselves. Sometimes yeah. you can say, oh my gosh, I can't wait till this is over with, and you're not fully present. Right. We want to help them see the, the, the finish line, but still help them be fully present just so we can kind of help them process the whole situation, or yeah. the, whole pro the whole experience. Right. Um, and then when they return, we do have them go through a debriefing yeah. where... Some of that is, is journaling, or some of that's just hanging out with, with friends and, and yeah. teammates. Some of it's just talking and, and uh, expressing things that you experienced. Um, it, it's pretty informal. Mm -hmm. There's a, a really a, um, a strict code to the briefing. It's just all about um, you know, personal relationships and, and communication and just ways that we can um, kind of flesh out the things that we've seen so whenever later on whenever we are kind of going through reverse culture shock back in the united states right um they can kind of have people to turn back to or help them that they've already begun that process of communicating what they've experienced um, and they can continue that on so. okay cool well so as far as um getting interns and making team expansions presence known what do you guys do to go about making that happen um, we, we have a lot of um, travel that we do throughout the fall. Re really, recruitment is all throughout the year. I kind of hate using the word recruiting because um, I hate to sound like I have to sell the Great right. Commission. But, exactly. Um, but you do have to you you do have to have your your face out there, and you really yeah. have to put yourself out there. So in a way, yes, it is recruiting. Yeah. Um, but we do traveling to different universities. Um, we have a lot of meetings with different um, campus ministers. Mm -hmm. um, we also have many conferences that we go to. Um, every once in a while, we'll have a church that we will go to and kind of, you know, represent Team Expansion in, in the lobby and, and speak at a congregation. But yeah. uh, the majority of it is um, college campuses okay. and, and conventions. Okay. So, you know, college students wanting to get into team expansion, um, they want to do something with it. What is, um, if they wanted to make that a full-time thing, if they wanted to make that their life, what would be the best way for them to prepare for that? Well, I see it um, a primary role uh, for myself um, to, to help that process of what it's like to be full-time. Right. Um, not just offer an opportunity for students to go on a mission trip. Right. So our internships um, are catered around what's it, what is it actually like to be working mm -hmm. and living cross-culturally. 
yeah not just um, hands-on work a lot of churches go on short-term trips and it's just um, hands-on work yeah. for for this many hours in a day for for so many days yeah um, but we try to emphasize um, what it's like to be working and living cross-culturally because when you're a missionary you're living not as your home you're living right. in a cross-cultural setting so we try yeah. to help begin that process of experience of what that is you like. become a foreigner in a foreign land yeah yeah so um so if let's say a, st- a college student were to to be asking the questions just like my myself whenever i was asking whenever i was in college you know god i have no idea what this looks like i have no idea uh, what to do how to go about all of this yeah um, will help answer those questions for them and to kind of begin that process of, of getting experience and getting some hands-on experience but also what it's like to live cross-culturally as well yeah so. okay do, do you see any situations where people kind of get chewed up and spit out you know by well let me put it this way um, a lot of people are in the American evangelistic church are used to the idea of going on a week to two week mission trip but we did a summer internship and i mean that i mean that really did challenge us and it took a toll on us like like physically it took a toll on like on me but it it was still one of those things like where i think we were prepared pretty well for that but have you just ever seen a situation like where people will just get chewed up and spit out? Yes. Um, I think we're all called to be disciple makers, mm-hmm. but maybe not everybody in a cross-cultural context. Right. So um, although we do try to um, build a structure for these internships that challenges and, and put students in situations to where they, they may fail, yeah. Um, it's a structured environment to where right. they can learn through it, not just thrown to the wolves by themselves. Right. Um, and sometimes people just don't have the personality um, for that type of context. Right. Um, and they just kind of crumble. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I have seen people just kind of, in terms of um, not necessarily failing, because right. I think through that they were able to, to learn more yeah. about themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but but not quite um, fit for a cross-cultural context, if that answers your yeah, question. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, taking an overall look at the situation of the world, um, and as far as the ratio of like the harvest and the workers, um, what kind of a place do you think we're in? Do you think we're in a, do you think that, well, let me put it this way, I was having a discussion with my buddy Uh, the other day about John Piper's sermon about you either go, you send, or you disobey. Um, And that's, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, As far as that goes, where do you think the American, how do do you think the American church is doing on that? Do you think that there's, I don't know, what's your opinion? Well, um, I can tell you this. it seems like in the United States there is a um, a cloud of of negativity, mm-hmm. um, and that can really um, hold us down. Yeah. Um, but I can confidently tell you that um, God is on the move, right? Um, in amazing ways um, all over the world. Yeah. Um, in ter- in terms of, of the United States, yeah. Um, I believe the church is doing its job. Um, because we are the, the country that sends the most missionaries. Right. And therefore, if we send the most missionaries, we do have people stepping up to the plate. Right. Um, in terms of going as well. Right. Um, do I think we could do a better job in terms of discipleship in the United States? I do believe so. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are on a negative trajectory. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, though. You're right, because there's, I think, there is... A dipping point in the church because I think instead of emphasizing it and growing it in the home in the families it's the responsibility of your Christian walk is being left up to uh, a non-personal pastor 
to teach you everything you need to know and to not walk you through it. Um, I think you're right when it comes to that. Like there's just this dipping point of discipleship and that's important as well because it carries on into generations. Okay. Well, so what are some of the challenges on a daily or weekly basis that you face in your position of team expansion? Like, I know that obviously like you're having to recruit and prepare interns and everything, but for you yourself personally, like what do you have to deal with? Well, um, in terms of day-to-day logistics or in terms of just kind of a broad stroke? Uh, just a broad stroke, yeah. Well, um, g- given my experiences, I've, I've had the opportunities to see God uh, move in some pretty amazing ways. And... Um, and there is so much that Americans can learn from the global church. Yeah. Um, and just helping people to see outside their box is extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, because um, it seems like a lot of Christians, um, although they um, are you know amazing, I love my fellow brothers and sisters, I love the church, and I'm no means trying to tear down any anything that deals with that. But right. Um, it seems like a lot of people um, have a narrow approach when it comes to God and the Holy Spirit, yeah. prayer and, and things like that. Um, I had a friend of mine uh, take a trip to Africa, mm-hmm. and um, they were talking about um, demons and the Holy Spirit and things like that, and some things that they had experienced. Um, and my American friend asked him to tell a story. Yeah. And he said, I'm not going to tell you because you're an American and you won't believe it. Um, and, and that's a pretty telling um, statement. That's, I mean, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and so a lot of the people that I encounter that I'm trying to get involved with the Great Commission and mm-hmm. to see their purpose and to see their hand in the Great Commission, yeah, um, to help them see that is di- difficult because, um, you know, many people are, are narrow-minded. Um and uh, I don't put blame on that on them as an individual because you know I was once in their shoes, right? Um, but to help people to, to see that, um, and to, and to also see their vitality, yeah, in in the Great Commission. I mean, you potentially could be someone that saves a soul, right? And you can stand up in heaven, yeah, wearing a right robe with him, and you can put your arm around their shoulder and say, "Well, like, this is my brother." Yeah, like you had something to do with that. There is vitality. That's a, it's like a, that's a, that's a, a, a kind of a legacy that, that lasts for eternity. Yeah. No matter what your accomplishments here on earth, like you can't take those to heaven, but if you have a hand in saving somebody, they can look at you for eternity and be like, you had something to do with it. Yeah. And so helping people realize that can, can be kind of difficult because um, with the systems that we have in place in the United States and in, in the hoops that we have to jump through um, can kind of. Um, uh, hinder people from you know, truly experiencing God and, and their relationship with God. God. Um, and so it is my utmost goal to help people realize that. Yeah. So, so going to that, that situation, though, where the guy was like, I'm not even going to bother telling you a story because you're an American. What are some of the, if you had to, think of a situation what are one of the crazier stories that you've heard or a situation that you've been in personally that you've witnessed I guess out in the field <laughs> I'll tell you one that I've heard too and it's well um, it's funny you ask because it's one of the craziest stories I've heard is a story that I've actually had the opportunity to experience um, um, and one that you got to see firsthand as well yeah um, and um, kind of what I was talking about in terms of culture shock. Yeah. Um, I think that's what we experienced whenever we were in uh, in Sicily. Um, yeah. The culture was different, and it wasn't just we were messing with one, one culture. We were messing with several cultures because we were working with refugees. Yeah, so, it was Sicilians and West Africans of all kinds. Yes, and, and just whenever you're de- dealing with refugees from Africa and Italians, there's already um, a lot of messy situations whenever you deal with that. Yeah. Um, and so 
uh, with that culture shock, with the, with the heat of the day, um, the freaking heat. God. Um, okay, keep going. I'm sorry. I just remembered all the heat in Sicily. <laughs> and with the lack of fruit that we are experiencing, yeah, um, uh, I think that you can second the statement when I say um, that was one of the most discouraging um, few weeks that I've ever experienced. Yeah. Um, in the midst of all of those struggles, um, and in the midst of trying to start spiritual conversations and Bible studies, it seemed like um, nothing was taking um, root. And and go like for myself personally, going to a mega church where you see people getting baptized every single week, and you're out there for two months, I felt like a loser. I was like, I'm terrible at this. Like I should go home. Like this is I'm I'm so dumb. Yeah, and, and it, it, I can remember the day when it was like I was staring at a brick wall, mm-hmm. and I can remember you know, praying to God, saying, "God, why am I here um, if you weren't going to help me breach this wall?" Um, I can remember all of us um, expressing together, um, you know, we are here doing our part. And then we yearn to God, saying, "God, please help us out here." Yeah. Um, and, and it seemed at first um, there was nothing but silence. And I can remember we still um, uh, were g- continuing to just experience discouragement, discouragement. And what it, it was about week four. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think you were in the in the beginning stages of the the first Bible study that we um, were able to to get started. Yeah. Um, and we we were you know on cloud nine just because people were willing to meet with us right <laughs> not that anything really came out of that but just that we were it was just it was we we broke ground in some way because we're like good this is what we're actually here for yeah and so, after four weeks of this <laughs> and you talk about um, having a change of priorities and, and what excites you you know it, that really puts you in your place yeah and um, I can remember. Um, this Bible study, where um, it continued, like most um, of our conversations, yeah. just continued to be um, in debate form, to where we would try to have this Bible study, yeah. but they would just come back at us like it was a debate. And I think I, I had, I definitely had some fault in that because I think I set the tone of it that way because when, when Ryan Hale came to one of them. He was, he showed me that it was like, here's how you keep it from being a debate. Like, you just kind of be like, okay, well, just what were your thoughts on, or like, how did you feel about just what happened? But that was still on me, but like, I still, you're right. Like, it was kind of hard because I think in a, in a place in the world somewhere where they've never heard of the gospel or Islam, it's not really like a, okay, who's right here sort of thing. It's like, oh, I've never heard of such love or kindness. So this was a different animal. You're right. Yeah. But. And um, I can remember we met as a group um, to the point where we came to the conclusion that we would meet one more week if it continued to uh, uh, be in this fashion. Yeah. Um, and I can remember we all... I took that pretty difficultly because um, it was like we were just brushing off someone's eternal destiny. And that was like, wh- whose call was that too? Was that Ryan's? We like. I, I think uh, once we kind of liberated, it, it kind of talks about it in I think Luke six, where um, Jesus sends out um, a group of people in twos. It was the 72 yeah. followers that he had. Yeah. And if people were not receptive to brush it off your shoulder and to move on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that verse came to the surface and as, as difficult as it was, um, as discouraged yeah. as we were, um, that's what we came to the conclusion as. Right, so we, right. we thought, okay, let's meet that one more week. Yeah. Um, and I think our host missionary was in that that last meeting. Yeah. Um, and um, in, in all these Bible studies, he had printed the, the Bible verse that we were studying that week um, off for us. And so he brought those to that mm-hmm. meeting. And um, the uh, meeting continued like it had in the past. But yeah. um, they had also recruited um, another young man. Um, 
uh, who had uh, grown up in a household where his father was the professor of the Quran. So he didn't necessarily know um, the, the Quran as, as truth as we see the Bible, but rather right. a legalistic code. Uh, for life, and yeah. being that his his father his father knew the Quran very very well, he could uh, uh, debate with Christians. He he could reference the Quran very, very well. well. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think it came to the conclusion of okay, like this is what say. we believe, right? And, and this is what we this is what you believe. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in a way that had a, a strong impact on him because it forced him to, to question. And it forced him to think because we were not willing to be, debate with him. We were not right. willing to um, enter into that argument because we truly believed in Jesus Christ and, yeah. and the testament that, that he offered yeah. and the testament that we, he ha has on our, our life. Right. Um, which is really cool to see because yeah. um, that's what it's about. And, and he also saw, you know, he saw individuals coming from a place where, you know, our lives are, are good and comfortable and how we paid money to come overseas to tell them about this. Like, that's what he saw, too. He saw individuals leaving their safe place to come to these, like, to this situation where struggle is happening and to introduce hope like from to a, to a person who left his home for the lack of hope yeah yeah exactly and um that, that meeting came to an end mm -hmm. and uh, our host missionary um kind of put down the final uh seal of this is what we believe and this is what you believe mm -hmm. and it got to the point where I mean, it was ended Right, uh, but um, our friend, who was uh, very um, adamant on, on arguing, mm -hmm. uh, marked out Jesus being the Son of God. Right, um, which was pretty powerful for him to physically take a pen and to mark out those words. Yeah, um, that was a powerful statement of belief. Yeah, um, and and that's that was that, that ended. And right. I can remember we all um, gathered together that night in our little apartment. Um, that four bedroom apartment hitting the peak of our discouragement yeah um, because we had four days left yeah and we were discouraged because of the fact that we had to move on and this man did not believe that he was destined towards an eternal life and health and I can remember we um, came together, and I think this is one of the most powerful moments that we had as a team. Yeah. Um, in the midst of all of our differences that we had experienced in the beginning, yeah. um, that any team's going to face, of getting to know each other, um, yeah. we were able to come together, I mean, we prayed for 24 hours. That's right. For um, our friends that we had been sharing with and had continued to um, have a dead-end road with. Um, and we called out to God like we had throughout the whole summer that God pursue these individuals and he make himself known. You know, all of us had just heard stories at this point that um, Muslims were having dreams right. um, of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And um, we asked that specific thing for the far friends, that God would make himself known to them in a bold way. Um, and I can remember going to the camp the next day um, and in one particular person that had been in, in our meetings, yeah. um, whom we had continued to share our testimony with yeah. uh, separately, yeah. each, each of our group members, yeah. um, I can remember seeing him kind of acting a little different tonight. And myself and, and Andrea mm -hmm. uh, met with him one on one. That's right. And we were outside of the building, the rest of us were outside and, of the building praying. And, um, he, we had beforehand been talking to him um, about about Jesus, um, and we tried to make connections with things that he was seeing in terms of the turmoil that he had experienced and was seeing yeah. in Italy, and uh, the violence and hatred and evil. Um, and we tried to talk about Jesus and who he is and who he who he what he offers. Yeah. Um, and and you know we figured. Um, 
with with the direction that he was headed that that he would accept Jesus. But um, after we had left, because our departure was was coming close, as you said, um, well, we were just honored to to have our hands in the midst of that journey. Um, but we would have to pass that on to the host missionary whenever uh, we left. And um, on this particular afternoon, um, our friend seemed a little um, different. And I can remember kind of pressing a little bit, asking him to kind of share his experience, because I wanted to, and to, to make sure he knew that we were there for him, because right. he didn't have a lot of friends where he was at. Yeah. And he stopped for, for a couple of seconds, and he said, um, you know, Ryan, last night, um, granted this is after we prayed 24 hours for, right. um, for Jesus to, to make himself known. He said, last night, um, I had a dream. Um, and in this dream, um, a man in white approached me, um, and he was glowing, glowing enough to where I couldn't see his face. And for some reason, I trusted this man. Yeah. And uh, because I trusted him, whenever he reached his hand out to me, I, I took it, and he led me into this large room, so large that I could not see its uh, its walls in the back corner that marked its endpoint. I mean, people filled this room, so many people that I could not uh, count. Yeah. Um, and they were all uh, waiting to eat um, until I arrived. And, and he was like, Ryan, I cannot explain to you the, uh, uh, the community and peace that I experienced um, in that dream. Um, and then I woke up. Um, and he stopped. Um, he seemed pretty emotional, uh, as was I. <laughs> yeah. um, and he said, I feel something right here as he pointed to his heart. He says, I cannot explain it. And I said, I can confidently tell you that that was Jesus mm -hmm. because of three things. First being, um, that is what I read in Revelation 19 uh, when it talks about the bride of Christ and Christ mm -hmm. coming together in the, in the celebratory supper that they have. Um, and the multitude of, of people in right robes, you know, who have mm -hmm. belief in Jesus yeah. that uh, cannot be counted. Yeah. Um, second, um, last night, we prayed that Jesus makes himself known to you. Right. Um, and I'm witnessing an answer to prayer. And three, that same feeling that you're experiencing is what I experienced uh, when Jesus came to me. Um, and he was kind of taken back, and um, uh, we just kind of celebrated with him in a way. He hadn't quite accepted yet, but we celebrated with him and uh, ended that conversation for the day. And I think the next day um, was our last, and we yeah. went to the camp and just kind of hung out. We didn't want to press anything on anybody. Um, we figured this this friend would would accept Jesus, so we didn't want we wanted it to be his decision, not you know our decision that we were forcing on him. So we didn't really talk much about anything, just about friendship. Right. So I remember we just play around, and um, it kind of came time for us to leave, and we all said our goodbyes, and yeah. it was pretty emotional. Yeah. Um, and that night we had a um, a party at the host missionary's home, uh, kind of a going away party, and uh, I can remember getting that text from him. Yeah. That said, um, we want to change. Yeah. And we want to change only because of uh, what you guys have spoken about. Yeah. Um, and, and I can remember all of this kind of just stop, um, one of in excitement and, yeah. and, and awe. It seriously felt like Christmas. Yeah. And <laughs> we also were kind of in shock because we noticed the word we. And so we were like, what is going on here? Yeah. Um, and so we were all kind of in a frantic <laughs> yeah. um, mode there and kind of ran over to our apartment, got things together, and we ran over to the refugee camp that they were living at, and uh, we all kind of met together and decided, since myself and, and Andrew had been meeting with him, that we would walk up together and everyone else would stick around and pray, Yeah, um, as we had done before. And I can remember walking into that room, um, and sitting in the center was our friend, but there were also two other people. Mm -hmm. So I sit down and uh, look at him, and I ask, uh, so, so what's going on here? Um, and he says, well, you know, we've been having these conversations. You know what I've experienced and what's going on with me, so right. um, you kind of know what's up, but uh, I'll let uh, the other guys kind of share with, with, 
what's going on with them. So I look to his to his left, and it's his best friend. Yeah. And uh, as I was leaving, whenever he had shared his testimony, I, I encouraged him to share that with his friends. Yeah. Uh, because you can talk about the Bible all day, but until you truly experience Jesus, that's when it really becomes powerful. Yeah. You, you can't debate with something you've experienced. Right, exactly. And so I, I encouraged him to share that testimony of the dream, and that's, that's what he did. And so he shared it with his best friend. And I looked at him, and I said, so, so you know, give me some context and share a little bit about what's going on. And he said, um, you know, um, John, it's a pseudonym, We'll give our friend John has been sharing um, with me uh, the dream that he's experienced, and yeah. you know our past. You know what we've been through. Yeah. And you know that we have nobody except each other. This is my brother. Yeah. Um, and what he tells me, I see it in his eyes, um, and I believe him. Mm. I believe him. And I said, "Wow, that is awesome! Praise God." Then I look to his right, um, John's, mm -hmm. and. Um, Sitting on his right was uh, the young man who had marked out Jesus being the Son of God mm -hmm. um, in that, that earlier meeting that we had. Uh, the guy I never would have expected to be sitting in this room. Um, and I asked him to share a little bit, but before I could get that sentence out, he stopped me and he first said, you know, Brian, I want to apologize to you guys. Um, because um, ever since that day that I marked out those words, um, I walked upstairs to my room, I laid down on my bed, and I have felt something right here as he pointed to his heart that I cannot explain. He says, what you say is true, and I believe. Yeah. So we went through that entire Bible the, uh, the rest of the night, uh, come about 11.30 at night. The three of them had uh, professed their faith in Jesus and uh, put his arm behind them, and the next morning they were baptized. So uh, That's like... Um... That's a situation where there's no middle ground, you know, like that is such a significant situation that comes about. It's, it's not like, oh, well, like as far as his dream went, be like, oh, well, a lot of people No, it's, this is a, it's a situation that, that you just won't, like I said, there's no middle ground. That's all there is to it. Yeah, God literally changed hearts in front of us. Yeah. Um, and when I talk about trying to help students understand their role in the Great Commission, but also see uh, beyond mm -hmm. uh, the box, yeah, uh, that's what I want them to understand, that God can do anything. And yeah. I am here to say He can, and I have witnessed it. So. And it's in ways that you don't, it's in ways that you don't even understand sometimes. Because very, like, we very well could have gone home and in our minds nothing happened. Mm -hmm. But because of our involvement in some way down the road. And prayer. And prayer. Something else could happen. Yeah. And it's... And, and I just read um, about a couple months ago, five new baptisms have occurred. Seriously. Um, so um, disciples are making disciples in Catania. And also, I need to tell the audience as well, the reason why we don't mention their names is for their own safety. Um, the, the culture there is, um, it's, it's a pretty difficult thing for somebody to um, willingly leave behind um, something that they live by their whole life and to um, accept the gospel. It's, it's more... You can argue it's more dangerous for them than it is for any of us and what we would ever have to deal with here in America. So that's why we don't mention their names and it's for their own safety, basically. But that's cool. That's cool to talk about. And, you know, I think, I don't know, you can you can witness and experience something on a weekly or, uh, or, or two-week mission trip. But I think for anybody who's ever really considering going to a corner of the world for an extended period of time, they need to they need to hear something like that. And they need to understand that and understand that that the journey that they may embark on would 
would be something that they can't fathom and they need to realize how important it is to prepare themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really cool thing that you're doing, you know, everything with your involvement in team expansion and preparing people to go. Um, and you also yourself go to different parts of the world a lot. You've been traveling a lot here lately, going around all the United States. What is, uh, what is your next destination? Um, there's a potential that I will be heading to, um, Southern Asia or um, East Europe um, in the uh, beginning of the new year. Okay. Um, for the reason of um, field visits, um, for the sake of my own yeah. um, benefit, because I do plan on being on the field yeah. um, in the near future. Um, I see this role as a stepping stone. Okay. Um, so it's kind of a vision trip in my own way that I have the opportunity to experience and learn. Um, but also it helps me to learn more about fields as I communicate to different uh, students. Okay, cool. Um, we also have different um, interns in that part of those, those areas as well to where I'll be going and checking up on um, to make sure all their needs are met and to make sure that the missionaries are adequately equi equipped to, uh, to mentor and to guide them cool. um, in ministry. So. All right, cool. All right, well, here's what we're going to do here. I always ask a few rapid-fire questions at the end of the episode to get a little gist about you and everything. So, um, just one at a time, we're going to fire them off and then we'll end the episode. Yeah, um, be interesting. what is your favorite book outside of the Bible? Okay. Um, I think one powerful book that I have read is wild at heart. Wild at heart. John Eldridge. John Eldridge. John I did. Heard. I read that too. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very good book. So. I feel that it's, a. Uh, it's good to help you get to your roots, I guess, as like a man sort of just kind of having a, an yeah. honest, mentality uh yeah i like that cool what's your favorite movie um top three if you don't have a my favorite. favorite movie is the secret life of walter mitty oh i could have said that i totally forgot about that um and it just it's an awesome movie that uh centers around um not wasting your life yeah. and just truly getting to the heart uh, of what you enjoy and chasing that. I feel that. Um, it is a secular movie, um, but the premise can still be spiritualized. Um, but I would say my second favorite movie, it's actually taken from a book, um, is The Insanity of God. Um, and just like what we've been talking about, how God can work in amazing ways, um, that movie um, talks about that. Didn't we watch that? We did. We did watch that. You're right. Cool. Um, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Or if you can think it of, of anything off the top of your head, um, I've received a lot of advice, but now that I'm on the on the hot seat, um, <laughs> um, I think it's important to be um, an active learner, no matter what age. Um, Keep educating to always, yourself. To always explore, to always push yourself, to always um, reach the limits, limits, and to uh, just be the best that you can be. Um, and that can apply to just uh, secular life, but also spiritual life as well. Cool, cool. Um, you can answer whichever one you want. Favorite music um, or favorite band um, or I'm artist? A big, I'm a big um, indie music fan. Okay. Um, some indie folk too. So it's a little more on the, on the chill side. Um, Do you like John Prine? I might do. Yeah. That's folk. That's folk yeah. to me. That's the folk that I listen to. But yeah. do you know that song "Paradise" I by do. John Prine? Uh, um, I I know a lot of songs, but I'm bad with with song names. Like, so. uh, <laughs> "Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg?" Yeah. Yeah. You know that song? Yeah. That's here in Kentucky. No, oh, okay. So yeah, Very I'll nice. tell you about it afterwards. Okay. But uh, cool. So you like that favorite artist? Um. That's difficult because there are so many out there. I feel that. Um, I don't know if I could pinpoint um, any um, any specifics. Yeah. So. No worries. Um, let's see. I, I really like uh, um, music soundtracks as well because I think there's a lot of power in uh, sometimes not speaking. Okay. I'm gonna let just the experience um, speak. Um, through you so like the soundtrack to like a movie or something yeah or? yeah so 
I guess I like Hans Zimmer's oh, stuff. Hans Zimmer's wonderful. For uh, like uh, Inception and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, those are great. But uh, are great. one of my favorite songs that he did was in Interstellar. Oh, I love that was, soundtrack. Yes, yeah, The Revenant. Too. Uh, that's not Hans Zimmer, but The Revenant. But The Revenant is what the, yeah. But uh, yeah, I do enjoy that too. The um, Edward Shapiro too is, was, is one of my favorite uh, just instrumental okay. artists. Okay, cool. Um, if you could give the audience a piece of advice or, yeah, if you could give the audience a piece of advice about anything, what would you give? Um, I would say um, uh, your personal walk with God um, is a journey. And it's mm -hmm. going to have uh, seasons and it's going to have ups and down. down. Okay, let me restart that. <laughs> um, your, your personal walk with God um, is going to have of different seasons and you're going to have ups and downs um, and you're going to have uh, mountaintop experiences and there's going to be some low, lows in the midst of those as well. Yeah. Um, but I would say in the midst of that, even in the midst of doubt sometimes, is mm -hmm. to continue to, to put one step in front of the other and every day um, try to broaden your box in which you place God in. Yeah. You can say that, no, I don't put God in a box, but we're, we're finite beings. We do right. put God in a box. Right. Um, and my encouragement and advice is to just try to strengthen and broaden that box every day, especially as you pray. Um, and, and as we can hear from that story that we had the opportunity to share, um, uh, God can do some amazing things if you just um, are honest and broaden that box. So. Awesome. Cool, cool. Well, I think that'll do it for us. That's going to wrap up this episode. Ryan, thank you so much for being on. I appreciate it. It's an honor. It's a great uh, opportunity to share some awesome things going up on throughout the world. So. Absolutely. Um, last piece, if anybody wants to uh, get involved with team expansion in any way, how can they go about doing that? Well, you can uh, head to our website, www.teamexpansion.org, um, and uh, click on the, the bar, the up bar, go. Um, and there are many different opportunities that you can get involved, whether that be um, just uh, filling out a profile to get in contact and we can uh, start that conversation with you and you can even come to our home office in Louisville um, and we can present you different opportunities or if you're on the you're ready to go and you want to do some, maybe a summer thing or or a semester thing or maybe you're you're uh, at the point where you can go full-time um, we can get that ball rolling as well and you can do all of that uh, through the website as well so awesome all right well guys thank you for listening I hope you're able to learn something today um, thank you guys once again. We'll see you next time.